ask if you would to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 17. We're going to keep consistent with the theme for today and talk about old men. <laughs> we had John this morning, we got uh, Abram tonight. We're going to change his name tonight also. I got to thinking about tonight, and tonight is about names. We're going to, hi young lady, where are we going? Is that dad? <laughs> okay, he'll be here. We're going to talk about names tonight, because we're going to look at four new names that are given to us in chapter 17 of, uh, of Genesis. I'm just wondering, what is your favorite name down through the annals of time, as you know it? Uh, what names have people had that you've liked? Huh? Ethan? Okay. Caleb? Daniel? Okay. Well, y'all are spiritual. <laughs> I was thinking, like, there was a wrestler named Dusty Rhodes. I thought that was a cool name. I wasn't thinking, you know, in depth. There was a girl in high school named Candy Kane. Daniel? Okay. That's your favorite? Matthew? Matthew? Okay. Okay. Uh, we had a guy in Tulsa, in the Tulsa phone book, when I was a kid, I remember looking it up. His name was Rock Backwards, which was, I thought was an interesting name. I always wanted to be called Johnny Ringo. I thought that was a cool name growing up, you know, Johnny Ringo. You couldn't lose with a name like that. But we're going to look at some new names tonight, and I want you to think tonight, if you were given a name in accordance with who you are, and names in the Old Testament uh, meant everything. They were very, very significant. And names would change in accordance with how God's uh, work would change. You know, Saul became Paul. You know, different times, people's names did change. Lucifer became Satan after he uh, fell and no longer was a light bearer but was an adversary. So the name was very essential. And you're thinking tonight, what name would you have if you were applying it to who you are right now? What would be an appropriate name for you? Well, something that's very interesting here is we look at the last verse of chapter 16. And chapter 16 is all about uh, another incident in the life of Abram and, and Sarah, Sarai and Hagar and the birth of a young child named Ishmael. That last verse says that Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. You jump to chapter 17, you think you're just kind of waking up the next day in Abram's life. But the first verse of chapter 17 says, Now when Abram was 99 years old. So we just spent 13 years between chapter 16 and chapter 17, which means that Abram, uh, that Ishmael is how old? He's a teenager now. I mean, that, that has gone, just the fun stuff has started for Abram. He doesn't know it, but those teenage years are just on the brink. You know, Mark Twain said that when a child gets 13, you got to put them in a barrel <laughs> and feed them through a knot hole. And then when they turn 16, you're to put a plug in the knot hole. <laughs> so that's a very fun age, isn't it, Shiloh? So a couple of 13-year-olds right there. That's, a, that's what Ishmael was. And God didn't speak for 13 years. And imagine that. We don't have that kind of attention span. And yet Abram was waiting 13 years for God to speak again. The church today has gotten so watered down, we have to have have spiritual things presented in such childish, non-attention span ways. I like listening to Paul Harvey, and Paul Harvey mentioned um, a week or so ago about a church in England, and this upcoming Sunday, the sermon was going to be presented at that church by a man in a clown suit, and he was in a clown suit on a high wire that was going to be suspended from one balcony to another, and they were having that to try to draw a crowd in, have that kind of sermon. Well, Abram's a whole different makeup than that. Here he is 13 years between the time that God has, has really had these, these significant events in his life, and God speaks to Abram. And four names that are introduced tonight. And the first name has to do with God. What God says to Abram, starting in verse, uh, well, the end of verse 1, he says, Now Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. 
God came to Abram, Abram who had had a relationship with God that was in a constant state of growth, that he had had some faltering moments as he had been in the midst of a famine and made the decision out of fear rather than faith to go down to Egypt. Horrible things came out of that. And then he has been recovering much of that all along the way, and yet he still has these moments of doubt. He's going to have another one in this chapter. The moment of doubt that he had after that was not believing God that God would use him to bring about this promised child. Abram asked God to take a servant of his, an elderly servant, and to use that person as the heir that would bring about all these descendants. God said, you've got to have more faith than that. I am going to use you, Abram, to do that. So out Hagar, whom he had been, had been a lady, that a, a bondmaid that had been brought out of Egypt, was Sarah's bondmaid. She was used by Sarah because Sarah didn't think she could be a part of this. And Abram had Ishmael with her because of a lack of faith. So he's had some falterings along the way. He's going to have another one in this chapter. He's going to ask God to do something else out of a lack of faith. But at this point, God appears to him and says, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. That word El Shaddai has some different renderings to it, different meanings that are attached to it. One of them is that God is strong. God is certainly capable of meeting the need that you have. The other is an image. And it's an image of a mountain. And it carries with it the image not of a barren mountain without any resources in it, but a mountain that encapsulates within itself everything that you need to sustain life. And God presents himself as a strong and mighty mountain that has within it everything that you need. He is El Shaddai. And whenever you see God as that, it demands a response of us. And God says to Abram, walk with me and be blameless. He's literally saying, be single-hearted. Have one focus, have one eye, and that eye be upon me. James warned us that a double-minded man, well, don't, he shouldn't expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord because he's always wavering. Paul told us about those who are tossed to and fro because they're like children. They haven't grown up. God is saying to Abram, you need to be mature and to walk with me with a single eye, with a wholly devoted attention upon me. And then starting in verse 2, you've got this list of I wills. There are 12 different I wills. When we understand who God is and we walk with him in an appropriate way, all of a sudden God starts doing these I wills, I will, I will, I will. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. What a great promise. What's Abram's response to that? He fell on his face. Here God appears to him, makes this proclamation of who God is, and then make, and reminds him of this covenant that God has made between him and uh, himself and Abram, and Abram just falls on his face in worship before God. You know, that is uh, the secret of a perfect walk with God or a blameless walk with God, a single eye walk with God is that uh, personal worship, not corporate worship that we have here tonight. And if this is all the worship you have in your life, then you're not walking with a single focus. Abram fell before the Lord all by himself, just fell before the Lord, and that's a secret to a, to a blameless walk before God. It says, God talked with him and says this, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations, so he's reminding him of everything that he's been saying since Abram was 75 years of age. So 24 years, his promise has been out there. And then he changes his name. You may be used to hearing Abram called Abraham, but it's right here in chapter 17 that he's finally, officially Abraham. He says, no longer shall your name be Abram, which is exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham. Abraham means a father of multitude. It's almost like God is, if God doesn't fulfill his promise, he's teasing <laughs> Abram. Here he is, 99 years of age. He has no children. He has no descendants other than Ishmael, which is out of the, the mode of God's will, and God is tagging him with this name, a father of a multitude. But God is going to fulfill that, that promise. Then some more I wills. He says, I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants and you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. 
I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That caps it all. All these other things are just reminders that he's been saying all along when he's told Abram to go out and look at the stars, look at the sand, that your descendants are going to be like that, that you're going to inherit this land. And here God is reminding him again of that and changing his name and giving him kind of an official tag that has with it that you are going to be a father of a multitude. So here we have Abram kind of moving up to this next level where God makes it more than official by giving him this, this new name. And God lifts his face up to kind of share this wonderful news with him. And that's when the best things happen. When we fall on our face before God and God kind of gets our attention, lifts us up and says, I got some new stuff for you. But if we never get before God, we never get in that position of personal worship, then we're never going to hear those wonderful things that God wants to reveal for us. You know, I, I like uh, driving. And I used to get in my car and I would find my ra favorite radio station or my favorite cassette, but I've gotten to the point, maybe it's a sign of age, that I just love silence. I like it quiet in the car. Maybe it's having kids in there half the time that when I'm in there by myself, I just want it quiet. And I have found that that's uh, a lot of times the only time I get quiet during a whole day, and I'm amazed at how God begins to speak to my spirit during those times. You know, when we were driving to Dallas, you know, one kid had headphones on, another one had the little game thing going, and another one had, we had a TV in there with an earplug in it, and I was kind of all alone in the quiet. And God just was dumping things on me left and right, convicting me of things and giving me ideas for future, kind of speaking to me about issues regarding uh, our church and, and just unloading things. But how often do you get in that position? Do you get in personal worship, personal solitude before God? so that God can have your absolute attention and begin to speak to you. You know, David, his secret is, is something that we see here with regard to Abraham. In, when David fought Goliath, you have this long list of I wills that are, that are mentioned here. David understood that. Because David made a statement in, in 1 Samuel 17 where he said, The battle is the Lord." That's why he was willing to stand out there and take on a giant because he understood this was more than just about him. And God is emphasizing that to Abraham. This is more than just about you. I am going to do all these things as a result of the promise that I have made to you. And if you're faithful, then the rewards are going to be, be great. He's going to inherit all the land of Canaan. He's going to have this wonderful legacy of kings and descendants. You know, if he's faithful to God, God will carry all these things out. I was listening to Adrian Rogers this, uh, this past week. I don't know when it was originally preached, but I had it recorded. And he was talking about Noah's Ark and just made the point that when Noah was preaching and before the rain fell, Noah was all by himself in the midst of all these scoffers on the earth that ridiculed him and made fun of him. But after the judgment fell, when Noah stepped out of the ark, he owned it all. <laughs> it was his earth. You know, he inherited it all. After God was done, it was his. And God is going to do a miracle like that for, for Abraham as well. So verse 9, is, it says that after God tells Abraham well, all these things he's going to do, then he says further to Abraham, now as for you, after revelation comes responsibility, we have a proper response that we are to give. You shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. And then he begins to talk about, he talks about the obedience, the keeping it, and then he talks about the observance, which uh, here is the act of, of males being circumcised. He talks about every, that Abraham should, be, Abraham should be circumcised, every male among his household should be circumcised, his servants, those who are born in his house, those who are bought with money, it says, all of them should be circumcised. That is a sign of the covenant. Now, something that I read years ago, and I just want to throw this in because it, it impacted me. And it says here that at eight days they are to be circumcised. And there is a book out there. It's been out there since the 70s called None of These Diseases. And I read that book around the early 80s. And in there it talks about circumcision and about this passage or this where they are told in the eighth day that they are to be circumcised. You know, Moses also writes about it in the law. And how... That eighth day is very essential. This is a medical doctor who writes this book, 
And he makes the observance that a baby is born and the worst time to have the circumcision would be on that first day, but the vitamin K in the system heightens itself for higher than it is in a lifetime on that eighth day. So if you're going to have any kind of surgery in your life, you need to make sure your blood clots effectively, then that eighth day of your life is the best day of your life to ever have surgery. And here God knew that, and he told them on the eighth day that you are to circumcise these, uh, these males. Well, in the New Testament, Paul talks about circumcision in Romans chapter 2. And he takes it to a deeper meaning. It's not just the outward sign that God was worried about and that God was uh, trying to communicate. In Romans 2, verses 28 through 29, God talks about that deeper meaning, that it's actually a circumcision of the heart that God is most interested in. That we get, at, get rid of anything that is an obstacle that stands between our heart and God. And God is giving this this preliminary sign that he's going to deepen in, in the teaching that will come through the revelation of Scripture, but it's given to a, as a sign to Abram as part of the covenant. Uh, verse 15. After he talks about circumcision, you've got a new name for God, which is El Shaddai. You've got a new name for Abram, which is Abraham. And then here's Sarai. And she, for all they know, is out of the equation. God is going to remind them that Sarai is going to be a part of this miraculous birth. Abram's been trying to do it in all these other ways. But the revelation he's going to get in this chapter is that it's not just you that's going to be involved as the father, but Sarai is going to be the mother as well. Verse 15, it says, God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall, not, you shall, now, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And Sarah means princess. Good name for someone who's going to be the mother of kings. You know, Princess Di was the mother of the future king of England. And that's the reason she was called a, a princess. Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. That's new in the equation. That hadn't been mentioned. That's the reason that he grabbed hold of Hagar and, and allowed her to be a part of that. Because now this revelation, he's understanding it in a deeper and deeper way. I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, if he's 99, how old is she? Anybody remember? 90. She's 90 years of age. She's 99. Does it surprise you what is said in the next verse, that Abraham fell on his face and he laughed? He was overwhelmed with what God was, was suggesting, that this elderly couple, you know, come, they needed a combination uh, walker and uh, baby buggy, you know. They imagine them in the baby ward, you know, him out there waiting for a child to be born. Just, you can just all get all this imagery about how, how odd this would be for this to happen. It says, Abram fell on his face and he laughed. And I think that is neat that when we really get serious about God, and we allow God to share these wonderful secrets that are on His heart, His desires for us, that are part of the promise that He wants to bring about, and God has just kind of given it to Him in bits and pieces, and, and it's just, even bits and pieces, it's overwhelming Him at every spot, and how it just, it's amazing what God really wants to do. And if we were to get in the same position as Abram, Abraham has gotten himself in personal worship, allowing God to speak to us. You know, things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, you know, that has not even entered into the heart of man. God desires to do in our life. And when we really understand the magnitude of what God wants to do, it will amaze us. We will just laugh hysterically just thinking about, it. could that even be a possibility in our life? You, know, you could probably think in your own mind uh, right now about something that God pulled off in your life that you would have thought never would have been possible. You know, I am so thankful that God doesn't give me the future. Because if God would have given me at a time in my life what he was going to do in the next five years in my life, I would have been so overwhelmed by the thought of it all being even a possibility that it would have scared me to death. But God kind of gave it to me in small portions that I could digest. And here he's doing that with Abraham as well. He fell on his face and laughed and he said this. He said, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? The obvious answer is no way. But then you get God involved, and it is. You know, nothing is impossible with God. 
Well, Abram is not just amazed. He's amazed to the point of not really even believing this possibly is a, something that could happen. And he says this to God. And this is this point of doubt. And this is kind of where, if you're going to take anything away from the night, it's this warning here. And he says this, Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. God, what you are suggesting is so overwhelming to me that I don't know if I can handle I don't know if I have the faith to go forward with that. Let me look around and see what I can handle. And why don't you accept that? God, I don't know if I could believe for an Isaac, so why don't you accept Ishmael? Trying to bring God down to a level where your faith exists right at the moment. Where God is trying to bring you up to a faith where a miracle exists. There's a lot of tragedies where Ishmael's have been settled for. Where we settle for things that are at the level of what we can believe for, rather than stepping out on the, the limb of faith and believing God for things that really challenge the faith where we're at. Maybe, it, maybe in the area of uh, finances or other things that God promises in His, in His Word that it's just too big a, big a step to take. That's just too challenging to believe that, to, to put myself out by faith on that big a, a challenge or a promise is just overwhelming to me. God, why don't you allow this to be what you bless? Because I can believe you at this level, but up there, it overwhelms me. God, let, let Ishmael walk before you. Accept Ishmael. And God doesn't want to accept Ishmael. God refused to accept Ishmael. God goes on to tell, tell Abram that Isaac is the one by who the promise would be. Uh, verse 19, he says, But God said no. God said no. And I'm afraid that maybe the reason why we don't see a lot happening in our life because we've asked God to accept the Ishmaels and God has said no. And we're kind of at a, st at a stalemate. Because God's not going to accept the level we're trying to get Him to accept. And yet we're not willing to go up to the level where God wants to bring us. And so we've got this stalemate happening. Nothing's going to change in our life till we say, God, all right, I won't even offer the Ishmael anymore. You tell me where the Isaac is, and I'm going to set my focus on that. No matter how much it, it uh, overwhelms me with the thought of me stepping out with that kind of faith. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Laughter. They've been laughing all along, and when... We're going to see when Sarah hears this same news through, a, through the wall of a tent as she's eavesdropping, that she's going to laugh as well. And he says, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So don't even bring up Ishmael again. Then God does assure him that as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. Is that a good thing? We got those descendants around us today. They're bombing buildings and bringing down airplanes into buildings. And Ishmael's descendants are the Arabs of today. But God, you know, that's the Ishmael that God, that uh, Abram wanted God to accept, that was brought out of this lack of faith situation that the world has continued to pay for even to this day. Verse 21 says, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah will bear with you this season next year. Finally, he's got a date. He knows when it's going to happen. Not just it's going to happen, it's going to be like the stars. Now we know one year from today. The next verse shows the faith of Abram, Abraham. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, that moment, and you may have that language in your particular text, that immediately or the, that, that very day, I think it says in some. Abram took Ishmael his son and the servants who were born in his house and all who were bought with money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, household and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day as God had said to him. Now Abram was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. You think a pacemaker is a rough... Uh, rough surgery at your age. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. 
The very same day Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael his son. That very same day. And all the men who were born in his household. And of course, the marriage also, uh, you know, consummated or however you'd say it, that in order for that to happen in the next year, they got, got on with that also. Amazing. An amazing promise that Abraham is given, and he is wavering in faith all along through all of these years. And yet God very lovingly brings him along step by step by step, refusing to let him back up too far. But God says, keeps wa waving out in front of him all these wonderful promises that God has. And maybe God is bringing back to your mind repeatedly, I'm still out here. I still have this wonderful plan that I want to do in your life. I know you've gotten distracted this direction. You've allowed uh, years to kind of go by when you knew that I kind of wanted you to be more serious in this direction, but I'm still out here. I'm still out here. No, I'm not going to settle for Ishmael. We're not going to go there, but Isaac is still here. Isaac is still here, and that is my plan, my destiny for your life. And however that applies to you. Here we have Abram. And he's got this new name, Abraham. He's got these new responsibilities. He's got this new life. You know, I like new things. I can still remember the smell of a new car. Uh, it was a Geo Metro. <laughs> it's the only new car I could ever afford. But my dad had a new Cadillac, and I remember the smell of that. That was just, the Geo smelled just as good. But I can remember, you know, new things. I like new things. I can remember when my... My uh, family, when I was about 13 or 14 years of age, I guess 13 years of age, we built a new house in Manfred, Oklahoma, moved into the city for the first time in a long time. I remember that new house. Remember uh, new clothes. You know, whenever you get something new, you've got to wear it as soon as you, you get it, you know, because there's some rule about that. Just new things are neat. And here, Abram is like a kid at Christmas. He's got all this new stuff. And it's all fresh and exciting. And you know, that's the way the Christian life should be lived. That every day, God's mercies are new and His loving kindness is fresh and He's got something brand new on the horizon for us to, to be challenged with. But for that to happen, we've got to take this other stuff and be current with it. Let our faith keep things fresh and keep us walking fresh before God so that God can constantly bring these new things along. I'm going to ask you if you will.